between movies and TV shows, like you say, series, was the Hatfield and McCoys, was that a series for you? Which one was like your first series you did? That was, yeah. That was a, a series uh, s- that was based off of a, a feud that happened in uh, basically my county, Pike County. I grew up in Floyd County, but Pike County and then was the uh, McCoys and the Hatfields were on the West Virginia side. And um, uh, I, you know, I, I knew that that was going to happen and I got involved in that. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, that, that was shot in Romania for f- four months because of Roma- in Romania, it's, you know, again, incredibly cool and gorgeous country, but, there, you know, in the Carpathian Mountains, they were doubling for the Appalachian Mountains. You know, they're a hundred years, you know, behind which is incredible. You know, there's people in horse and cart. I don't know what it is like now, but you know, we shot there because there's no telephone poles and there's no nothing. Um, so that was the draw and obviously is probably much cheaper to shoot there. But again, that is, you know, thrown into the deep end and, you know, sink or swim. And, and there's another crossover with Boyd and I that, that, uh, some of our listeners have heard before, but, um, and Boyd and I have talked about it, I know Morgan and I have, but uh, my family is related to the Hatfields and the McCoys. So my great grandfather. Well, dude, that's an side, easy thing. That 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 family tree looks like a stick. Oh, yeah, There's buddy. no branches. There's no branches on this tree. <laughs> <laughs> but my great grandfather is John C. Hatfield. My, my, branch. my great grandmother is Lucinda McCoy, or some people call her Sarah. And those are the two that married that ended up, um, you know, stopping the feud. And so we always joked around that you know Boyd played my great uncle, Cap Hatfield, Hatfields and McCoys, he played me in Narcos. So who the hell are you going to play next in the Murphy family here, brother? Oh, man. I, that's, a, that's a good question. That's <laughs> just keep getting weirder and weirder. This is how it's like an uh, episode of Twilight Zone. Well, the reason I ask that is, is when you approach a series versus like a movie and other stuff, wh- what changes for you in terms of like your prep or the things you have to do? How, how fundamentally different is uh, apples and oranges, you know? Um, the difference between shooting a film and a, and a TV series, um, you know, it's, it's same, same, same. Um, there is, there is a compactability in terms of the writing that, that happens in a film that where in a series, um, those things are, are, are kind of more drawn out and they're a bit more cerebral, um, where if you have a, a scene in a film, for example, um, that has to pack so much of a, a punch. Um, so many things that need to happen in it because of the, the, just the physical real estate that you have to play with. You have an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and we're in a, in, in a TV series, you can, you can really draw out that more and you can, uh, linger on story more story between, you know, the characters, not necessarily like plot or something like that story. It was like, how is, you know, what's the story of this guy's, um, life or is, you know, the arc of his, of, of, of his character, the story that he's, he's living through. So it, it just takes, um, a bit more punch in a, in a film and, and a bit more of a sort of maybe think about it, the, the hair and the tortoise, you know, the tortoise is the TV show and the hair is the, the, the hair is the, um, is the film. So as you're doing this now, now you're progressing through the episodes. When did the actual import of what Pablo had done to that country? I mean, in terms of the bad shit, blowing up shit, you know, killing people, when did that kind of, for you, I, I know you were doing research, but was there a point also during the filming of this where you're filming some of these things and you're going, I mean, did this shit really happen? I mean, is this the way, I mean, was there some kind of a, uh, you know, an epiphany or a realization where you go like with the DEA Academy where you go and you go, man, this shit's real. Yeah. I think in the early episode, there's a guy who gets, uh, bagged. Um, they suffocate him out and, um, uh, you know, it just, it, it hits you of, of really what, what, what motivates people and, and, you know, money is, is, is such a, a motivation for these, these people and these, uh, communities and, and what they're re- really willing to do. And I'd never seen poverty 
before like that in Colombia. And to, to get yourself out of one of those communities, you have to be, uh, you have to be a phenomenon. You have to be a rock star, uh, you know, phenomenal football player or, you know, there is no, you know, to, it doesn't, this doesn't happen that way. You know, generationally you, you know, you can, but it's just that, that really hit me of like how severe these living conditions are and the chips stacked against these people was, um, I think what you're, you know, the wake up call that I got. And, um, you know, some of the other things that, you know, not even half the stuff that Pablo did made it into that because I don't think they could have really had a character, you know, I think he had, uh, a fetish with, you know, younger girls and stuff like that. That was, you know, you very decisively left out of the show because it was such an unredeemable quality, um, for Pablo and, and the show kind of needed some, you know, him to be interesting and, and, um, uh, you know, uh, ex- exciting villain to, to watch, but you know, there's a certain line that he crossed, um, in reality that, uh, that the show just, um, I think it's just too much to, to take on. Well, and that's, that's kind of what I was getting into as well too, because, um, as you go through the show, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that he did. What I was very interested too is, is your relationship with Wagner Mora. Cause the interesting thing I learned from Steve, I did not realize that, but Wagner didn't know Spanish. He had to learn Spanish for the yeah. role. So when you guys are doing this, everybody talks about, well, you got to stay in character the whole time. I, I was listening to, I think it was a uh, Kevin Pollack one time. Cause he does a great impersonation of uh, Christopher Walken. And he says like, once you yeah, get into does. it, you- <laughs> I, I worked with him on a, on a film called uh, Bella, Bella magic of Bella Island with Morgan Freeman. And he take a breath, take a breath. <laughs> He's got a great Christopher Walken. Yeah. There I was walking to the store and I thought, I, you know, well, what a tragedy, you know, the way he did. But he talked about when you get into that. So when you started getting into the role, is there a thing about getting into the role and staying in, um, staying in the role while you're working, you know, staying, uh, you know, as Steve Murphy until the day's over? Yeah, there, there's, there's like little things. Um, it's, sound, I, it may sound odd, but you know, it's, there's cue words or, 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 you know, just staying in the accent. There's certain things that you can do to kind of like, Oh, that's, that's the tone. That's the note. Um, that this song is played in and, um, you just kind of get back into that note and, and, and that's, the, and that's a good thing because that's, it gives you borders to say, this is out of bounds and this is inbounds. And once you create those borders, you just kind of, um, get back in that pocket. So did you feel yourself having any anxiety being around? I mean, as he's playing Pablo, does it reach a point where you go that, I mean, he's doing a damn good job playing Pablo. That dude kind of scares my ass, you know? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely motivates you. Well, you better bring your A game too. You know, it's, um, he's, a he's a phenomenal actor and I don't, you know, that's a huge undertaking and also just the confidence just to, to do something like that, just to, to speak and learn an entirely, you know, different language and have a performance in that. That's an incredible amount of focus to have. Yeah, I was, uh, you had something, Murph, but I was just impressed by how good his accent was, how good he did the language, you know, for um, uh, not knowing it before he got this role. Yeah, a lot of people ask us uh, what our thoughts are on the actors and actresses. I swear, and I'm not just because, you know, Boyd and I are now friends, but um, I don't think they could have cast this any better than what they did. And regardless of whether it's uh, uh, one of the other names they were floating out to play my part was... Uh, Taylor Kitsch, is that his name? Taylor Kitsch, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think they they sold him on um, True Detective season two, and he he bound, he, he thought that, it, you know, that was a, a better job to take. I don't know. Maybe he didn't want to be in Columbia. I don't know. He's, he's, I've met him once or twice. He's a really, really nice guy. And, and those, um, are, those are good actors, but I don't think anybody could have done any better than you did. Yeah, but there is something, too, that when you're when you're doing something like – narcos for example that you know you you put in jake or whoever it kind of distracts you from what the show is about because 
um, with a fresh face, you, you, you don't have any, um, um, you know, set intentions or it doesn't cloud what's happening. You, you're just more invested in the story than all the other films that that person brings with them. Um, so it's, it's an interesting conundrum in, in terms of a working actor of being able to, um, you know, to take on projects or not. But, uh, I think they cast the, the thing great because you got to discover these actors through the show rather than, you know, going there to see a movie star, you know, you're going there to see the story. Yeah. Well, you know, when, uh, eventually when we all ended up out, uh, it was after the premiere of season two, we were all out in Hollywood at, uh, at the Milkins house for that fundraiser that night. They had the big movie screen out in the backyard and all that. Um, that's where we really, that was the first opportunity we really got. I mean, I'd met Wagner on set that during season one and he was such a nice guy, but then his wife was there with him that night. And for him to have played such a bad, evil person, he did a phenomenal job. But oh, then yeah. when you get to meet him and talk to him, he is one of the nicest, most humble people you ever meet in your life. I'm like, how do you pull that off? Because I remember seeing him in the movie Elysium, and he was playing a mm-hmm. wacko dude in that movie as well. Oh, yeah. He did a fantastic You know you've job. done a good so, job no. playing a character when people see you on the street and they want to beat your ass. I don't like you. <laughs> no, no, it's just a, I'm just an actor. It's a role. It's a role. You know? Yeah. And he's, you know, he he did a he learned the language. He also moved his entire family to Bogota from from Rio, Brazil. And uh, put his kids into school there. Wow. Um, you know, changes uprooted his entire life. Um, but it was worth it. I mean, that was one of the, I think, one of the greatest, you know, performances in a while. You know, the, and I, I got to tell you, man, the, um, that when we showed up at set there, the first, you know, we, they had a van drop us off and it was out in that old castle looking place. You know, I guess I think it was an old school mm-hmm. or seminary, whatever. Oh, yeah. And, and we're walking up, and and we don't know a soul. And lo and behold, here comes uh, Diane Kennedy, who was played the ambassador in season one. <laughs> and she's like, oh, are you the Murphy? And she just kind of took us under her wing, and she was the sweetest thing. And then, um, oh, the guy that played the uh, the military, Patrick uh, St. Esprit is his name. He was, uh, I mean, he's been in some, he plays a tough guy. He was the, the CIA or head or military guy. and just. <laughs> in, in real life they're just so opposite of these mean ass characters they play in the shows man just people that you just never forget the rest of your life well it's funny i mean it, it you know it you play this horrible person and you know like high you know high, highest level of make-believe that you can do and then you know, what's the, it just makes it easier to be a good person when you're not on set. Yeah. <laughs> I got well, all that stuff out of the way. Yeah, I got it out I, of my system. I can put up with anything. I can, I can be. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, let's face let's just be real honest here. Portraying Steve Murphy, it wasn't that big a challenge. You know, I'm not that deep a person here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, uh, it was an honor. And you know what? To, to figure out how people work and tick and, and all that stuff, that's, that's just the real joy that I get out of doing this. And, um, you've had incredible life, Steve, and done some really, uh, pretty prolific things. So Uh, I've been very blessed. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a cool thing to portray you, bud. Thank you. Let's kind of talk about, I want to wrap up the first season, just talk about the second one. But as you look at the script, how far out do you know what's going on? It's like, I mean, you've got a couple of things like they kill the cat, which they never did. I mean, but you know, that's got Connie, but how far out do you know what's going to, do you know what's going to be in season 10, your kidnapping before it happens? No, 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 not at all. And, and I think that's a tactic that they, I mean, I did a show before Narcos. I think I did the big C, um, with Laura Lenny on Showtime or something. And the same thing. I mean, maybe she gets the pages, but I never, you know, they would not tell you what's going on because it, maybe they don't want you to foreshadow anything and to be, you know, really just straightforward about it. Like the writers were playing catch up the whole time. So they don't really may not know what's going to happen, right? They're, they're, you know, they're, they're writing, they're submitting to Netflix and Jose, and then they're getting notes and then they're rewriting. And then by that point, you know, sometimes we would be, you know, not shooting for a week and just hanging around waiting for those scripts to come in um, because they had just such a, 
I guess, a level of integrity that they're trying to match. So, you know, I had no idea. I just knew that, you know, probably by the end of season two, um, we might get to Pablo, but yeah, the whole time, just in the dark, the entire time, d- by day by day. You know? Well, let's talk about a real stand-up thing you did in uh, season 10. You get kidnapped. And that's not the season stand-up t- thing I'm talking about. Now I got kidnapped. Episode 10, you mean? Yeah, yeah, episode 10. Yeah, season 10. Hey, we're bringing it back. There's another eight season we're going to sign you up for, boy. Oh, Lord. <laughs> hey, but but episode 10, season one, um, Murph's two daughters, you do a real stand-up thing for them. You remember what that was? Uh, taking them in, you mean? No. You put them in a scene. Oh yeah. Oh well, you're talking about uh, you're you're blurring the lines between fiction and reality, man. <laughs> um, well, you know, I thought that was the least. Um, I thought that was a pretty cool uh, thing that could happen for them, given their whole life story. I mean, for those don't, who don't know, you know, Steve Murphy adopted two beautiful girls uh, out of Columbia and and really changed the trajectory of uh, their trajectory of their life. And at the end of season one, Javier and um, Steve and his wife, Connie, come down with the girls. And um, at that point, I was pretty well entrenched with the crew and and those who who make some of those choices. And I was like, you got to put these girls in, in the show, man. You got to. And then I saw how the camera's being set up. I was like, no, 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 no. And I, they ain't going to go there. They're going to go over here. <laughs> Well, we got them on camera. Yeah, well, you, Steve you had the rest them, of the story. Yeah, you you had them do some things so that, and I remember you saying this. You said, now "You this is what you got to do, girls, because if you do this, they can't cut you out of the scene." Yeah, and that's exactly, exactly what happened. But you know, and then and here's the funny part about that: after season one came out, you know, Narcos is out and, and it turned out to be a big hit. They'd come up to me and they're, "Hey, Dad, I'm in Narcos. Are you?" No. <laughs> It was some hard asses. Did they get paid scale for that? I mean, did you get scale for that? You know, because they were in a scene. Hey, well, let me ask you about that though, the, the, because the way Nar- you know, it's not like a TV show where it's where it's episodical to where you know there's an episode comes out, an episode comes out. Netflix released everything at once, you know, so it's it's there. How you probably thought, hey, this is going to be good. Were you surprised about how good it was? You were you surprised about how? I mean, it was like at one time, weren't you say Murphy was one of the top five streamed series ever on Netflix? Well, there would, um, when we went out to, for the premiere of season two, there was an extremely high Netflix executive there, and I'm not going to say his name um, because he's still there. But uh, at the party afterwards, we were all standing around talking and, and uh, you know, just getting to know each other, and, and they'd just shown the premiere for season two, and we're just having, a, and they were treating us like kings and queens. And Javier and I went up to him, and we're like, so what did you really think about Narcos? You know, did you think, he said, after I saw the first episode, he said, that's when I ordered up two seasons. And I said, well, how popular is Narcos? He said, you ever heard of, um, oh, what was the show with Kevin Spacey? Uh, oh, um, House of Cards. House of Cards. House of Cards. He said, that's our number one show of all time at that time. He said, Narcos is knocking on the door. And since then, I think it was probably a year ago, I saw uh, an internet, an, an article on the internet that said that uh, it was rating the top rated original content series from Netflix and Narcos was number four overall. Yeah. It's pretty damn good. Well, the, yeah, I mean, you could feel, you could feel how big the show was and and that's a hard thing to like, well, how could you feel that? But, you know, Netflix was not even in Central America, not even in South America. Subscribers is what I'm talking about. And so that show was a transitional show for them because now we've got a Spanish speaking show and we don't have any markets. uh, We don't have any subscribers in South America or Central America. So you're talking hundreds of millions of subscribers at that show that Netflix got through the show of Narcos. Um, you know, you're talking about Argentina, Brazil, uh, Mexico, co- you know, Costa Rica, all, all these people. Now, you're they're, they're, before they weren't able to have a subscription to N- Netflix and through that was the introduction show to get them into the platform. So um, it, you could, I mean, you know, globally, you could feel how big it was. And I think that was a cool thing about the show where 
it was in a way interactive. And what I mean by that is that you're having to listen to whatever language that you that you speak, you know, firsthand, whether it be Spanish or English. And then, you know, most people don't speak multiple languages. So they're, they're having to read the other part. So there's in, they're engaging in that way. It's keeping them glued to, um, to the show. So, uh, it was a hybrid in a sense, and, um, you can just feel it explode when it came on. Well, that was, uh, you know, when this whole thing initiated, I think they were in Columbia because Javier, before they started filming, <clears throat> Javier took uh, Eric and Jose and, and Chris and a lot of the main personnel to Bogota, spent a week with them. They went to Medellin. He showed them around where we used to work, where we used to live, where things were. And they were talking one night. And he said they had one hell of a heated argument. Um, I think it was between Jose and Eric. And it might have been some alcohol involved as well, but the discussion was the voiceovers, you know, and you did all the voiceovers for seasons one and two. And, and I guess everybody was against that except Jose. And they said, Hey, go watch, um, what's the mom movie? Um, geez, I, I, my, I'm just not good at films. And it's the one where the, he starts out as a kid and then he gets into mob. Joe Pesci's in there. Um, good you know, they're hijacking hijacking vehicles, uh, Ray Liotta. It's he's he, good fellas. Yeah. Good fellas. Oh, good yeah. 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 He, and yeah. he does the voiceover and he told him, he said, go watch good fellas and then tell me what you think. And Jose yeah. had the foresight and that's the reason they did it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it was, it was, um, me and Pedro are both doing voiceovers and maybe Wagner had a little bit too, but, um, I, I, I saw Elite Squad, which is, uh, Jose made two of those films down in Brazil and Wagner was, you know, the lead of that show. He was playing a cop himself and he was doing the voiceover. Um, and I, I, I just used that as a template. I was, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, like, so we were using the Goodfellas reference, but the Goodfellas reference is, uh, here's, here's a difference of, uh, Morgan of asking about difference between television and, and, and film is because in Goodfellas you have you have two hours. So, you know, I approached it like, well, I have ten hours, you know, so I'm not gonna be this um, you know, loud, you know, present this is a crazy story and then this happened, and it was, you know, a, it was more of a, you know, telling a story around a campfire because, you know. 10 hours of me, you know, bouncing off the wall audio in a Ray Liotta, all due respect, a fantastic job on that, but I just didn't see it applying to Narcos in that way. However, just using that, it was also an, also a, um, a linear one character driven, uh, voiceover telling you, telling you the story, but we had, you know, again, you know, we had a, a bilingual show and we had 10 hours. So, um, I kind of did it in in the vein of, of Jose's first two films, um, Elite Squad One and Two. I think that was the perfect choice because if I give an example, if uh, I've had one case where we actually set precedent uh, in federal court where a cooperating defendant died before we got his statements, he had HIV. He was in Atlanta peten penitentiary. He died before his co-conspirator was arrested. His co-conspirator went to trial because he thought you know his buddy's dead and he couldn't testify against him. We were allowed to read his testimony, his recorded testimony. And I did the reading and you had to, they, you had to read it where you could not use inflection to try to drive the jury to believe something. You tried to stay as monotone as you could. And, and I, that seems like what you did there, which is more along the, the official judicial lines of the way you would tell a story. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how we approached it. And not to be, you know, a characterization of, um, an exciting voiceover. I mean, it was, it was a different tone. It was a different, um, morbidness to, um, to actually the facts of going on down there. It's the old dragnet, Jack, you know, Jack Webb, just the facts, man. You know, the just way the he narrated Los Angeles, you know, the city of angels, you yeah. know, Hey, we're going to be bringing this to a close cause we appreciate your time, but let's, let's talk about season two real quick too. And shocker, hey, spoiler folks, Pablo dies. We've talked about that. He's room temperature. He is no moss, no more. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. 
and there is a very historical inaccuracy we have talked about, and it's about you being present when ha- Pablo's killed. While in reality, mm-hmm. Murphy was back at this, back at the uh, uh, at the base yeah. uh, eating rubber chicken, and you know, waiting to hear what yeah. happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so how was that? How was that to be? I mean, you think about this. It's the culmination of it. This is this is it, right? You're, you're, the series is at least for you is coming to a close. But I mean, I get goosebumps even when I think about it, even though it was on TV, because I've watched Narcos several times, you know, in season three. But just seeing this is the worst of the worst. This guy came from having these millions of dollars burning cash, doing whatever he wants. And now he's in a sloppy pair of jeans and a shirt, barefoot, running away from the cops. He's got one Sicario left. And that's that's the glorious end to the world's, at that time, biggest narco trafficker. I mean, it's, it's uh, rags to riches to riches to rags. Um, it was incredible, incredible life that that guy went went about. Um, you know, barrels of of money and refrigerators here and there. Um, you know, countless bodies. You know what? What? What a turn the country upside down. You know, it went from a uh, you know kind of a messiah to, um, pariah, pariah. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so, you know, I, I didn't, I, I think for, for the choice of the show that, um, you know, since I'd been such a pivotal part of telling that story, I think they kind of, you know, been the creative, uh, the choices to put my character, uh, in, in there. And I think it was always debate, you know, debate. I don't still to know to this day if anybody has ever claimed, you know, uh, Pablo. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this stuff. There we go. So I don't know if anyone ever claimed, you know, who 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 ended up getting him. I, I thought I, I mean, it was pretty much a sniper. It probably got him one of um, military guys from across the way, or, or I don't. Wait, you want to? dive into that steve and <laughs> yeah no it that? was uh it was it was straight out to columbia national police and and uh even the uh the head of delta force the army's delta force uh general jerry boykin he, I've, he and i've stayed friends over the years too and he's written a book about it never surrender super book by the way we hope to get him on the podcast someday and talk about his time down in columbia but uh he even says the the people that killed pablo escobar the columbia national police I've got a good idea of who actually fired the shot that, that killed Pablo, the shot in the head, but it's not something that I, I care about anymore. You know, uh, I just want, Javier and I want to make sure that the world knows it was the Columbia National Police. It wasn't the Gringos. It wasn't the SEALs. It wasn't Delta Force. Could those guys have done it? Absolutely, without question. But we want the world to know what the truth is, and that's the Columbia National Police are the true heroes of the entire investigation because they took the country back from that piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. It gives me goosebumps just hearing you talk about that because, you know, the people, the people's lives just riddled with, with terror and death and, uh, just maniac shit. Um, and you got a better understanding than most people on it. Well, I think about, I mean, yeah. I was going to say, no, I think about, uh, too, Tom Segura. Steve was on Tom Segura's podcast. Uh, what was it, Between Two Palms or what? Or not between, but um, I, I forgot. Remember. No, that's Zach. Anyway, oh, he's great. Yeah. yeah, well, he, but he went into it and Murph, but, tell, but the, the, the setup was Tom was thinking, oh, you know, Pablo's more like Robin Hood, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so he he gave me an opportunity to tell the story, and and it wasn't confrontational. It's you know Tom is easy to talk to, I think, and we had a very very good time. And at the end of the conversation, he said he so I he said I got to tell you, you have changed my mind. This is not at all what I thought this was going to be, and and Pablo Escobar is not at all who I thought he was. And you truly have changed my mind, which doesn't happen very often on this show. So, I you know I've, I didn't I didn't know who Tom Segura was uh, was back then, but I do now. Oh, he's hilarious. Um, yeah, you, well, you, you know, I think that's just a classic move from a criminal, you know, uh, look over here, don't look over there. And, you know, when you don't have running water and, and sewage and stuff like that, people throw in, um, throw that into, uh, the community. Oh yeah. He's a great guy. Um, you know, while he's, you know, destroying people's lives as a foreign and, uh, and, and abroad and at home. 
And then, you know, you learn about the other little fetishes as there's, there's no redeeming qualities whatsoever about Pablo. I think just for entertainment value, wow, this guy is a bad guy. You know, he's, um, you know, you know, in TV world. Yeah. It was great, you know, fun. You couldn't stop watching him. Um, but you know, for creative reasons, you, you couldn't show everything because then it just, that would have been like is. a turnoff at some point. It would have been too much. It I mean, would, absolutely. you get behind the, yeah. the killing system. Well, let's hey, look, we're coming up on our time that we had agreed upon with you. Cause you've been oh, so okay. generous. Stay over. Yeah. Uh, so you sure. Okay. Well, cause I wanted yeah. to talk to you though, too, about, I mean, you're going through this stuff. You've got basically two years into this now, um, you know, and you've devoted a whole bunch of your life. What's it like to finally wrap? What's it like the final cut, the final line, the final thing? You know, when does it really hit you as a, uh, hey, dude, this, you know, this ride is over? Yeah. I mean, between the first and second season, I, I, I'll be just so honest with you. It was, um, it felt like it was a, a prison sentence to go back to Columbia and, and to, to, to go through the gauntlet again for another nine months. And I, I just knew. The first time was so hard to, uh, to, to do it. Um, but then, you know, the second season actually, it didn't turn out that way. It was, it was, uh, it, we kind of worked out all the kinks the first season and the second season I had a different living situation and a little bit more comfortable, you know, cause you're living out of a hotel, cooking all your food, either eating out or on a hot plate for, you know, nine months. And that gets, you know, pretty old, but, um, the second season, it, 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 I was really not looking forward to it because I just knew how hard it was. And then I got down there, and um, and it was just a totally different story. And and you you knew how six when the second I think the second season premiered. Sorry, the first season premiered when we got down there uh, for the second season, and that made everything. Oh, okay. Well, this is a good show. <laughs> this is this is, this is a big deal. Uh, I kind of like it now. Um, you know, it's quick. <laughs> it's funny how quick your your point of view can change about something. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, stay on that point um, so for one like, second. Yeah. I, I don't want to talk figures, actually, but how do they? So when they pay you, Netflix is a little bit different. How do they pay you? Is it based upon you just get a standard amount, or do you get the equivalent of like residuals or stuff? The more it's streamed, yeah. the more it's done. <gasps> Mm -hmm. Well, that's the big problem right now that, um, you know, my union's on strike is because back in the house of cards days, let's just say that let's just talk about Kevin Spacey because he probably ain't working anytime soon. Um, you know, we'll give him a million or $500,000 to, for a season. And that's a hell of a lot of money. Um, and so you don't really say anything about it. It's like, okay, I'll do it. And then, you know, Netflix makes 30 billion, you know, last couple of years. And so they, they buy you out, they buy you out for that contract and they own that forever. And since they were paying such high, high money back then, people just look the other way. It's fine. I'll just, I've never been paid that much money. I'll take it. So that's the big problem now is because these streaming services make you know, astronomical amounts of money and they've re-upped their subscription to fifteen ninety nine to eighteen ninety nine, but then they're crying poverty that they ain't got no money to pay you and the residuals don't exist anymore. But the subscriptions still exist and your revenues keeps making money. And the series work. keeps getting streamed because you can look at the downloads, you know, and you can look at that download. So so now people are becoming wise and have become wise to, well, no, you actually, it's not fair. Um, because you know, I, it's, it's just, it's just funny how, uh, you know, money and greed can work sometimes, but you know, I think that's all being sorted out now. And I think they're going to get a fair shake because, um, yeah, people, you know, especially like music, for example, like a lot of uh, writers, they'll just buy you out, but then they own that forever. And then they can, you know, recycle it. Do they want to use your song on something else? They can do that. But, um, so now I think a lot of people deserve a lot, you know, uh, these, these companies are just making so much money and they all have different algorithms of how they, um, tally that, that every company is different. So, 
it's hard to pinpoint them down and say, you owe us this much money because there's different, you know, algorithms and different scenarios of how those streaming, um, services, how they're tallying them, for example. Um, so yeah, they, um, they're, um, I guess they're going to be held over the fire. So, you know, we've been told, Harvey and I have been told, uh, just trying to learn how this whole industry works at different phases along the way here over the past several years. Um, and, and we were told that <clears throat> the, the executive producers, when, when a series is done like Narcos, and there's a, the, there's seven, season seven is coming out the end of this year, I guess, depending on the strike. But for them to get paid, they say they have to sue, they have to file a lawsuit against Netflix or against the production company. But apparently Netflix is infamous for this so that even they get paid, you know, and, and I know because of the executive producer status, they get a certain percentage of points uh, of the budget and things yeah, like that. Yeah, but they're locked into that original contract is what you're saying is they're locked into that original contract. And though, even though the show grows exponentially, um, you know, you sign the contract this and there's no renegotiating, re- which is completely... Um, I mean, how many other industries – you think about sports stars, right, and Michael Jordan, right? You think Michael Jordan can't go back and renegotiate a contract as he gets better, as you win world championships, and his take doesn't get better? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, if you have a – you know, you have good representation, hopefully they, they try to figure that stuff out for you that we're going to renegotiate or – or I mean, it's just sometimes it's so obvious that, like, hey, guys, you know. This has had an exponential amount of growth, so we have to come back and renegotiate. That's why I've never signed a contract over two years. Um, a lot of these shows want to sign you on for seven. Um, and so I could tell you a lot of stories about people being signed on um, for shows and, and kind of, oh, well, you signed it for seven years. <laughs> Dang. Okay. But there's no, um, there's no annual escalation clause, maybe based on profits or... Well, I think now, you know, when it's so obvious, you have to renegotiate because then it becomes like maybe a, a bad PR thing for the for the project if that person wants to go out and disclose that. Um, and so it's it's case by case. It's 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 a it's just a you know a big mess, and I'm I'm hoping that this will all be sorted out because. You'd like Without to eat again, writing, wouldn't you? You'd like to eat Without again, writing, you? none of this stuff happens. Writers are the most important aspect to the game. If you ain't got writing, you ain't got shit. Let, yeah. And let me ask you about that. Because yeah. there's one big thing going on right now, and I thought it was interesting because I saw it a little bit when they brought back Carrie Fisher to be uh, Princess Leia and they used some um, AI to do it. You know, they used some CGI. There's that huge issue right now of they talk about somebody's going to create a network like CNN. It's all AI driven. They talk about replacing actors with AI. You know, you've got these, what is, you know, from your standpoint, when you're looking at this, even though they say they want to do it, my thing is, if I know it's all fake up there, then where's the community? Where's the fun? Where's the, I get to go, I get to go to Comic-Con and see the big stars. I get to go here and, you know, have Boyd on our podcast. I can't have an AI avatar on a podcast, which by the way, as we figured out too, this is your very first podcast interview you're doing, correct? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. And you're not AI, right? You're the real dude, right? We're... <laughs> I am Boyd Obrook. Um, <laughs> Robot um, voice. Um, yeah, What's the I, issue of AI? I think that, you know, I think a lot of people now are just sick and tired of bullshit. I don't know how else to say it, that, you know, you got to filter on your Instagram. No, like just people want authenticity. Now, I think the whole game of I'm rich and my life looks awesome and, you know, I can't, I'm just always great. And, you know, I, you know, I don't, I can't put a foot wrong. You know, people now just, you know, there's even social media apps that are like, and maybe one's called be real now that it's just, it will not allow you to put a filter on. It's just like people want authenticity. I think that's just within human nature to, um, to want that. Um, and so I don't think anybody's going to be watching a bunch of, uh, because it's the same in watching a, an actor's performance. When you hear a note that's not right, it's just off. 
And when you see a generated image that's not authentic, when that's not authentic, then that 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 turns you off as well. There we go. I got that buzzing to stop. Well, that shows um, that so your AI. I, this is artificially generated, right? That's voice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I don't think it's gonna. I don't think it's gonna stand. I don't think you know. But I do have a fear for uh, the future of cinema and future of uh, storytelling because you know nowadays with kids, it's like a movie to them is, you know, Marvel, Pixar, something like that. Like, you know, I think I heard Quentin Tarantino talking the other day. It's like, he was talking to this kid and the first time he saw Iron Man was when he was four years old. He saw the first Iron Man when he was four. And so he doesn't know like real filmmaking. Like that generation only knows like Pixar movies. If it's not a Pixar movie, then it was a a Marvel movie and it just kind of trickles down. And the last thing that you'll ever get is like a real story um, because they're just not brought up that way. They're brought up on, um, you know. Well, it's the green screen stuff. I mean, when I've seen some of these sets where it's just like a huge green screen and you've got all this stuff going on, I'm going as versus with Narcos, right? I mean, no green screens in that, at least that I knew of, right? Or at least most of that was like, you're in country. There's no green screen. There's... um you know, like back in the seventies when cinema was like on fire and trailblazing, you know, those were real stories. Those were real filmmakers. Those were real actors doing, um, real, real movie making. And now it's, um, generally nothing is real, you know, nothing, everything is, um, plastic. So hopefully that, that era will die out and then authenticity will be something that's um, craved to buy by people because we want to have connections. We need to have connections to make us feel like we are someone. And I think with those types of Marvel and those movies that it just doesn't, doesn't provide that. Um, you know what I think an interesting rating would have, uh, you know, cause they've got, you know, G, P, G, P, G, 13. I, I would like to see AI and uh, NAI, like AIs, you know, actors in here are AI generated and non AI. In other words, I could go to a movie and know everybody I see in here is a living, breathing flesh and blood human being. There's no AI in this movie other than, you know, throw in a plane or something, but it's like all the actors are real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I swear, I hope we don't get to that, Morgan. But that's, I mean, to your point, I think it's going that way. You know why? Because these studios can make money that way. Why should I pay Boyd Holbrook a big sum of money when I can pay a a, a computer programmer to generate an AI thing for one twentieth the cost? Yeah, but you can't recreate me because I am a real person. And even if you did recreate me, you'd have to pay me for that because that's, that's my IP. That's my intellectual property, my body, my image, my voice. Um, so if you want to subcontract a, uh, a generated version of me, um, I'm hoping that this strike will make you pay the exact amount of money that you would for the real deal. Um, how would, because, how would nice would that be to walk out to your mailbox and you haven't done shit except sign a contract and now here comes a big check in, but I mean, I'm not, I'm joking, but it's like, but it takes away the fun of acting, right? Um, yeah, I wouldn't work anymore. I mean, that would be pretty boring. <laughs> um, yeah. it would, and I wouldn't want to go. I mean, then also I wouldn't sign off for that because they're allowed to do anything that they would want to do. So I could make me look like a jackass. I don't know. You know, I'm not going to sign up for that. Well, or maybe make you shave a receding hairline again. Some, you know, some bullshit like that. <laughs> make you look like an old man. Yeah. Hey, well, speaking of that, I mean, I know there's kind of a break right now. A um, couple questions. How long do you think it'll last? And do you think it will get resolved favorably? Uh, yeah, I think it will get resolved favorably because there's an extraordinary amount of money that they are losing every day and that this goes on. Um, so it's a big problem for them. Um, and, uh, like I said, without the writers, none of this, they, you don't have material to make, you just don't have it. And if you don't have actors to perform that material, you have nothing. So there is an extreme valuable to talent. Um, and, uh, you know, these studio execs who have, um, 
a lot of opinions and, you know, they got to put their opinions out there because their salary, you know, you got to justify that salary when you're just saying yes and no, um, you know, then you're not, I don't, I don't know how creative some of those jobs are to the writers who are creating something from nothing to the actors that are taking something on a page and physicalizing that. Um, I don't see any of these studio execs, uh, doing that themselves. Yeah. I heard the saying one time, it's easier to be a critic than an author and nobody's ever erected a statue to a critic, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I'd like to know how many critics wanted to be actors or artists and just, you know, those who can do those who can't critique. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Bitch. That'll play on (laughs) words. Hey, well, well, let's talk about you now. I mean, I know there's strike, but you've, like you say, you're, you're starving yourself literally in front of us. I've seen you, you know, um, uh, not consume any food at all, just liquids. So What's next for you? What kind of projects are you doing now and what are you interested in doing? What, what will we see from Boyd in the future? Um, well, you know, I've, I love working with Jim Mangold. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm probably going to be working with him next year on something um, that the strike has pushed. So I kind of can't talk a lot about that, but I'm excited about that. Um, and then what's happened now, I was going to shoot this film with Samuel Jackson at the end of... Uh, uh, probably, you know, in September or something like that. Uh, but now it's been pushed uh, to November. It's a film called Last Meals, and it's about a, um, the, uh, a, 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 the first black chef working uh, is it an executive chef at the White House who gets uh, fired and disgraced and then finds himself working out, uh, working out of a prison. And he's the... Um, kind of a Shawshank Redemption little theme. Yeah, it's kind of he's kind of like a Gordon Ramsay hothead chef type, um, and then you've got this um, wise ass who's on a on a hunger strike because uh, I'm trying to, you know, prove my innocence of. Um, what are you in prison for? Murder. Yeah, and I'm on a hunger strike to uh, to kind of plead my case that uh, it you know didn't go down the way it said it went down. So, so you have an executive chef who can create just something from nothing. That's got, that's, there's the temptation right there. Are you going to eat it or not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm pretty dedicated to my, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I heard I was going to be doing this in May. So in March I started drinking uh, my food and, um, it has been a, how much weight have you lost? 37 pounds. Oh my God. You didn't have that much to start with, dude. I mean, you got to hold on to something if the wind blows. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's surprising, dude. I think, you know, you could, you could survive for six months without eating. I'm pretty sure. Like just, you you know, there's so much that the body can endure and survive on. I mean, you've got stacks and stacks of, of, of reserves that we just don't even know about. I've, mentally just kind of, uh, you know, I've gone down the rabbit hole and uh, figured out quite a lot that the, the body can, can go through and, and I'm, I'm healthy and got, you know, quite a bit of energy. Uh, I hit some low points, but you know, I've got a nutritionist and we're, we're doing this the right way. I don't want to affect any of my organs, uh, down the line. I've got a little boy to look forward to. So I love my job, but, uh, I'm not gonna, you know, put anything in line for him holy cow when you when you have like the voice coach and a nutritionist and, and acting coach and and all that do you pay for that or do this does the film the production company pay for that it depends it depends on how big the production is I, i'll work i'll work it into the deal like you know obviously for the this part uh, having a nutritionist and whatever they cost is what what it is and they're going to pay for it because it's a business expense so to say right right um but usually, uh, the people I rehearse with, um, it comes out of my pocket, but, um, you know, I, I feel like acting is a two way street. So I, I need somebody to rehearse, rehearse with for a little amount of time to make sure things are going to go the way I want them to go. But, uh, yeah, I, I'll, man, I, 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 I get down. I, I got all kinds of people. It takes a village, as I say, to, to raise a character. There you go. Hey, so what's your first meal you're going to eat once this role is done? <laughs> I mean, it got, there was, I lost 10 pounds in a week, uh, 
about a month ago because I couldn't get below 170. I just, my, my body was plateauing. So I just went through this grueling process and my wife was like, well, what are you going to, like, what do you want to, you know, now you've done that and you got to kind of like balance out a little bit. And she said, what are you going to eat? I was like, I just, I don't know. I don't think there's anything that, that, that's, that's, that entices me. So mentally, really, it's really wild, man. Um, so I kind of go back and forth of like, what would I have? But I definitely like ribs and, um, like a, like a, like just, just like chili, like bowls and bowls <laughs> you're gonna have another problem then <laughs> yeah yeah well no I, yeah there's a whole thing that we've talked about like i've got to come up i got i can't just like gorge I'll, I'll i'll get sick and hurt myself did you ever watch band of brothers uh, a little bit yeah well you know yeah. there's that scene at the end where they find one of the concentration camps and one of the things people want to do right away is start feeding them and it, it, people don't realize the doctors came in you can't do that if they eat mm-hmm. too much you can actually kill them there has to yeah. be a whole process yeah. to bring them, you know, and their weight back yeah. up and not saying that you're going to get that skinny, but it's like, that's the thing you got to be careful. You just can't turn around and just start eating like normal. You're going to have a whole, um, mm-hmm. you know, ride, you yeah. know, the roller coaster ride Slow. back up. Yeah. Yeah. You got to slowly go back up. Well, if, you, if you're going to maintain the, uh, the Steve Murphy appearance, you know, I don't, you know, I don't walk away from a table hungry. Just so you know, yeah. There's no like there's, my dad's generation. Yeah, well, that's no when we get into narco says, season twelve, Steve. That's when he'll start getting a knee replaced and uh, not walking up and doing the blue blue hair early bird buffet. Well, there's there's an old saying that says a good cop never gets cold, wet, or hungry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, kind of the couple final questions. So, what's what's a role you'd like to play you've never played before? That this, I mean, if you could craft your role this is what you want to do what what kind of role would it be oh gosh um that is a difficult one uh you know i i don't know i kind of put it i i always want to have you know uh an oscar winning performance at some points uh that's just what i'm after um in whatever vehicle that character presents itself in um that's where i want to go uh, so I don't know if it's, you know, hero, this type, that type, um, you know, there's just, there's just, uh, I, I just want a written performance. That's, that is, uh, something that, you know, is the best performance of my career. And that's, it's what I'm striving to find and to create. Well, and I know some of the rules don't right. they don't, the, your union doesn't allow you to promote current movies that are out right now we can promote it right um so dial a destiny i mean i'm a huge mm-hmm. indiana jones fan in fact there was one time when harrison ford between star wars and indiana jones i think was in the top five grossing top grossing movies of all time you know at one time so um without promoting it but i would like to know tell us about dial a destiny because that just came out you know of harrison ford's final film the final trilogy or the final movie in the indiana jones series what was that like Um, that was like living a childhood dream, um, you know, 40 years after, after, uh, you know, I wasn't even born in 19, you know, 1981 was when the first film came out. And I think I actually watched the second one when it came out. So I was like seven or eight when that came out. Um, and Harrison Ford is one of the greatest actors of all time, uh, in some of the best films of all time and being around, uh, someone like that, you know, I like to, to soak up what I can and, and be able to, to create with them. And it was, uh, a moving experience to be a part of touching experience to be a part of because it was Harrison's last, um, per, uh, performance in that character. You knew that every day going to work. Um, and I got to work with Jim Angold again, who just cannot make a bad movie. Uh, he's a prolific filmmaker, incredible person. And so, um, I just couldn't say enough good things about the the film. I mean, and it is a screaming movie from start to finish. Where was it's it amazing. filmed at? Where'd you do the majority? Uh, five, of it? Majority in London. Then we went up to Scotland. It's a lot of Scotland's uh, architecture is designed by the same guy from New York city. So we matched that. 
went out to Sicily for a month or two, and then we went to Morocco, all at the, you know, height of COVID. It's pretty funny, you know, you got all these lockdowns and mand- mandates and stuff like that. They're happening in all these countries, and every country is a little different. And then we get to Morocco. <laughs> it's like nothing ever happened, <laughs> you know. It's wide like, open. You want, a chick- you want a chicken? Whick. Here you go. <laughs> you know, it's pretty refreshing after all the hoopla and the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the hoops you had to jump through for, for that stuff at the time. You know, I mean, just listen to, listen to you sit here and talk and, and about all the exotic places you've been that, that most of us dream that we might get to visit some point in our lives. When you were a kid growing up, did you ever imagine that you'd be doing what you're doing now? Oh, absolutely not. You know, as a, as a kid, you know, I didn't want to be an actor. I, you know, I just, I didn't know. I maybe want I didn't know what I want. I didn't, didn't think about that stuff, but I knew as a kid, I think my great Grammy granny probably distilled this in me that you can do whatever you want to do. You can be whoever you want to be in life. And I just knew that always as a child, that there was no limitations to that. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I just continue to watch Jim Carrey do Fire Marshal Bill. And, uh, <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> you know, that's that, I, could, I nailed that thing as a kid. Who and didn't? So, I mean, in living color, you know, Damon Wayans, oh, the Wayans yeah. brothers, yeah. you know, it's hilarious. you know, best men on film. Yeah, just, <laughs> just the best. But I, you know, I didn't, I probably hadn't left the state of Kentucky, you know, uh, at around 18, maybe two or three times, went to Myrtle beach, maybe to Florida a couple of times. But, um, you know, I was like a deer in headlights getting up to New York city. Yeah. That's still, but a that didn't animal. scare me. <laughs> that didn't scare me. Excellent. Bring it on. Well, let me ask you a question. A uh, couple things too. Um, your podcast set up, I mean, Thank you for it. It was fun because Murph gives me a, ah, you're a nerd. Well, the nerd helped you set up your podcast. Yeah. But why, why, why do you got a podcast set up? I mean, what's, is there, is there something that you're going to be doing around podcasts? You're going to host one. You're going to be more guests. What, what do you, what's the purpose of the podcast set up? Um, well, we have, I have a little company called No Smiling and we have a little podcast group. Uh, our recent, um, success or show that we put out was called the big con that's on apple we partnered up with the fun meter guys and um i was about a guy who grew up in my county or in about 10 minutes where i grew up his name uh eric c con who had one of the biggest embezzlements uh ever in the united states history about 550 million dollars that was that on the workers comp claim yeah, oh, I know yeah. exactly. I I know exactly what you're. Yeah, that was that they made yeah. a series about that earlier, right? Yeah, they did a doc on it. And yeah, and we did the uh, the podcast uh, co- accompaniment. To and all that, those so. billboards he had around there, and he had the fix was oh, in yeah. with the judge and everything. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's happened in my town. Yeah. You're wow. kidding. Yeah. yeah, he's a wild man, old Eric C. Khan. Oh. That, that's why that name I was sitting there going, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. So, but for you, what's the purpose of the podcast setup? Are you going to be doing? Will we be hearing your golden voice, your radio voice, your NPR voice? Um, you know, I've um, I'm preparing to to play a musician soon. So I see the drum set um, behind you, the electronic drums, right? Oh yeah, that's just for me and my son to screw around on. Are you a musician? But, um, <laughs> I can play music. I don't know how well, but, um, yeah, I, you know, I have, this is for the podcast and, um, and this is for, um, you know, for, for, for training for, uh, that role that I'm going to do next year. Well, speaking of roles, kind of, you told me, and I, I didn't want Murph to get a big head, but you told me something yesterday. I do want to give him a little bit of props. Tell You said the impact that Narcos had on your career. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think I would have a career if it wasn't for st- you know, for Steve Murphy's, uh, life work that he's done. So, uh, I'm forever, uh, grateful to you, Steve, for your, for your work and, uh, service. And, um, without you, man, I, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. So wow. thank you very much. So, you know, I, I don't even know what to say. You're going to be hard you. to live with. I'm sorry. On this <laughs> next year. But I had to, in all good right. conscience, I we might let change that go. this to the Steve Murphy Game yeah. of Crimes podcast show. <laughs> well, one thing he will not be doing is shaving his head to do another receding hairline. Dude, that ship has <laughs> yeah. sailed. That is not happening. 
Uh, hey, I'm just curious too. Uh, we talked a couple of years ago. You were doing a, a little play right there and uh, brought Aaron Graham. We've had Aaron Graham on the show here. Uh, did that ever develop into uh, anything it's about the pharmaceutical uh, thing? Oh no, no, no. That was um, that was kind of taking that. That's I think a lot of people have, have went on that went on that journey and exposed a lot of that. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. You never know; it might re- resurface. It's it's a nasty. Hit oh yeah, there. I'm always trying to do something. I'm trying to do something with um, with UFOs and and stuff like that. UAPs. Did you them. watch the hearings? You when we were talking, you were watching some of the hearings. What do you think about that? Hey man, it's 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 exciting time to be alive. Um, you know, I think what's happening right now is what they're saying is that uh, these UFOs are uh, off planet. And then there are on planet made. So, you know, take, take a, you know, whatever, you know, famous crash, like a, if Roswell did happen, they've been reverse engineering that for the last, you know, 80 years. And now we have zero point energy, which means that we could get rid of fossil fuels and all that stuff. And we could advance to a type one civilization essentially. Um, so you know, I think I think it's very naive to say that there wouldn't be life on other planets. So this, you know, given all the information out there, and so we've we've had the ability to study those things for a long period of time, and I think now we've been making them, and so people are confused of you know what is what. But you know, we've we've definitely got the got the, uh, what do you call it? The technology. Yeah. And you know, I would have, I would have just written it off that I heard. I mean, you hear people on, get on Twitter, do podcasts. Wow. This happened. I was taken up by the alien, like Randy Quaid in Independence Day. You know, I come to find out everything you're talking about. is kind of like that. But, but when I saw the witnesses and you're talking about a former intelligence officer with the air force, you know, uh, uh you're, you're talking about a pilot, a commander, you're talking about people that got fricking. Th- these are not conspiracy theorists. They're people who serve their country and they're coming out. And then the one guy said, uh, yeah, we non-human biologics. I mean, we have. I mean, I'm sitting here going. To your point, it's like wrapping your mind around it. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. Going, okay, I don't. I'm not that arrogant to believe we're the only thing in the universe. But when you start getting presented with proof, that changes people's paradigm. You know, changes lives forever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like you know when electricity first came out. You know, we're using the technology, but really, well, the majority of people had no idea how it worked. And I think now if you are able to use, you know, zero combustion engines and make nine, you know, right turns and all that stuff, there's technology out there that is, does exist and we've been developing it, but, uh, it's just going to be kind of hard to comprehend, but, um, however it would be, you know, we could save ourselves from extinction with this information. So I think it's incredibly important that, uh, that all this stuff gets disclosed. Well, I equate the releasing of the information the way you talk about having to build yourself back after losing all this weight. You just can't throw it all out to people. You, there, there has to be a, a rhythm and a steady There's dialogue. A soft launch. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what they're doing. This is a soft launch. It's um, you know, a trickle out effect um, because of people getting hysterical, which I don't really if, you know, I don't, people aren't stupid. You know, it's like, some people We're are all, stupid. Lots of people are stupid. Some people are stupid. No, <laughs> We've that's, met that's some stupid point, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, people now have caught on caught on to um how the how the magician plays his plays his tricks. Hmm. All right, man. Well, hey, well, look, uh, this is a good place to kind of bring it to a close, but I mean, this is first of all, it's been fun because very rarely do you get somebody who's been so generous with your time like that getting this set up and and it's great to get you on the podcast. But you know what's really good is we've talked a lot about the backstory, but hearing it from your point of view about the season, about the way things unfolded, about what you learned, um, uh, you know, and working and you, you know, working with the names that you work, you know, a lot of people want to live vicariously. And I think that's why they want the realism. They want to live vicariously. They, that's why shows like Cops and other stuff. I mean, it's been popular for years. Why? Because people get to live in the moment without having to experience the danger. They experience the excitement. But I mean, this for me, this has been fun. I'm like a kid. Like, it's like you talking about Harrison Ford. I'm going... Look, I'm going through your list of movies going, oh, my God, these are the, the Fugitive. I remember David Jansen playing in the original black and white 
the fugitive on TV, right. Tommy Lee Jones, you know, and the, yeah. I made hard targets, you know, 20 miles out this, 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 you know, it's like, just, just, just to be able to talk to somebody who's played all those roles, man. I'm, I'm like a, fan. I'm like, okay, I've just delved, I devolved into fanboy. Apologies. There you go. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I pinch myself all the time. It's, it's, it's. Inc- I don't know what I did in past life to, uh, to, to deserve this, but you were a carpenter trying keep, from trying to keep my mouth shut and get on with. It. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to having dinner at some point in the next year. Yeah. <laughs> hey, brother, and been, I want a little bit more than a couple chips, you know, and a noodle. You know, we're going to have to have a real meal. Oh, so. yeah. It's, it's been an honor having you on here, boy. And it's, it's, I mean, it means the world to both of us, but especially me and, and, and your friendship and staying in contact over the years. So I'm going to tell you, Connie and the Absolutely. girls both know we're doing this today, and they all three say hi to you. So uh, um, if you're ever, ever in Florida, brother, you got a place to stay. Well, I might need to get my kid down to Orlando, so I'll, I'll holler at you. And uh, guys, it's been a pleasure, such an honor to be on your show. And um, yeah, I hope to do it again soon. All right. Well, you, you get a real neat project about you do something around aliens. We're your show. You come back, and we, we want to talk about aliens. All right, oh, that's uh, a deal. That's a deal. All right, you guys, hang tight. Don't go anywhere. Everybody else, stay tuned for the debrief. How many, okay, how many other podcasts get the people who played you in Narcos? <laughs> I mean, huh? Huh? Well, he told you this was his first podcast interview. We first got time. we got the very first interview. And we know, you know why we know that? Because we spent a little bit of time before the day before setting up all his gear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, too, everybody, check Boyd out. Go Google Boyd Holbrook IMDB and you'll see everything he's been in. People ask me if he's done anything since Narcos. Take a look. You can oh see everything he's been involved with. It's, well, it's we just, unbelievable. We just talked about, and I would have, I mean, uh, you know, look, um, working with Harrison Ford. You know, between the, the the between the Indiana Jones and the Star Wars franchises, at one time I think they said he was in the five or top six grossing movies of all time, and so he gets to work with Harrison Ford. You know, uh, he, he's uh, in Justified. You know, just yeah, he's. I mean, he's so versatile. He's working on his voice acting stuff, as you'll see when we uh, mm-hmm. when he he's got the Love Doctor, you know, thing down. <laughs> But you know what he was? He's just, a, you know what it is? He's just a regular guy. But the one thing I appreciate about him is that he's a, he's a regular guy, but he is a student and a, you know, student of his craft. When he, when he wanted to play you, he dove into it. And you know what he even did to make sure he could really imitate you, Murph? Oh, I know what you're getting ready to say. Go ahead and say it. <laughs> Shaved a receding hairline. <laughs> and you did all this time. I can't believe you never knew that. Never knew that. I, I spent I spent a couple of days with him in his trailer down in Columbia when they were filming season one. And, and uh, I didn't notice and I didn't see him doing that. <laughs> I guess he did it in his back of his apartment before he came out. You know, and again, here's somebody who's diving into it. But you know, the one thing give you kudos to, and this is what Boyd said, and you'll you heard it on the episode. He he credits Narcos for giving him his big break. He said, without that, he may never have achieved what he's achieving now. Never been in the dial of destiny. Never been in justified things like that. So, yeah, he's it, that was very gracious of him to give me that that little bit of credit there. I really appreciate it, Boyd. And I got to tell you, you know, we watch Narcos. It's been quite a while. We started watching it again just because, you know, hey, you know, let's do it. Let's watch. I got to tell you, I forgot so much stuff. So I'm just learning so much stuff about what was going on. I didn't realize how much of a freaking felon JP was in the movie <laughs> or in the series. And <laughs> oh my God, give him lead. Remember when they were, what was it, Gotcha? You know, they were. Uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, just remember, everything you see on TV is not true, everybody. It's not true. It's not true. But I like where he says, give him lead. <laughs> you, you know what? The writers did a fantastic job. Uh, Eric Newman, the creator, the executive producer, and all the writers, Chris Brancato, showrunner. I mean, those people are just fantastic. I, I, and I, we had such a good time. But I liked. I also liked our discussion we got in towards the end about not only his craft, but what the strike was about, the role of AI, how that's going to impact acting. You know what? Why he? You know why that's been a big sticking point for uh, SAG, and I think it's AFTRA, AFTRA, or whatever it is, SAG AFTRA. Yeah, something like that. Um, and so, yeah, so this, you know, the the guild of uh, studio actors and stuff, but. Um, it just it was interesting to hear him talk about that. It was, but you know what? We were honored that he gave his time, because you know he's he's got a kid. His wife was off in acting school. He's had to go pick up his kid, but you know he took off time from doing his house. 
Uh, and he was just gracious. I mean, he stayed on. We we actually cut it short. He would have stayed on longer, I'm sure, but we cut it short because we wanted to respect his time. Right, right. So just, again, I already said it, but I'll say it again. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Boyd, for coming on the show. Everybody, listeners, give us your, your opinion. What do you think? Um, if you liked having him on here, we can make some efforts to see if we could bring uh, maybe – some other actors from Narcos on, see if they're willing to come on the show and, and talk about their roles and, and give you their insights and everything. So give us your feedback. Well, that, we're real anxious to hear this. Yeah, I'd, I'd love, I'd, like you're saying, it'd be really interesting to get Wagner Moore on here and just look at it from his perspective too. Yeah, uh, that would be that would be phenomenal. Um, I, I found out that they invited him to go over to Saudi Arabia also, but his filming schedule, he couldn't work it in and, and – uh, I think they asked, well, the, I know they asked Pedro, and, and I doubt that it ever got to Pedro's attention, but it got to his agent who said, okay, million dollars. And they're like, yeah, we don't have that kind of budget. So, But it's you know Saudi what? Arabia, you make it they that, do. You they, make they, it to that level, they can. Well, Murph, you told me you got a half a million. Yeah. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> we might not be doing a podcast today if I had. <laughs> Well, hey, look, guys, we'll first look, we'll bring this to a close now. But, you know, so if you enjoyed this episode, please go on over to Apple, Spotify, hit those five stars. It's magic. We don't know how it works. It's David Copperville, David Blaine, you know, all that good stuff. Harry Houdini. It just works. That's all we know. Head on over to Game of Crimes Podcast dot com. Look at the pictures. Go look at these pictures. In fact, look at the one of the pictures. It's got uh, Wagner, Mora, Pedro and uh, Boyd on a panel. I didn't recognize Wagner at first. He drops he, he put on weight to play Pablo. Yeah. And then he dropped it. You know, he's he, doing the reverse of what Boyd's doing right now. Yeah, he. I think he said he gained thirty pounds. To and and the cool thing about Wagner is, and, and not to get off on Wagner, but he had, he moved to Medellin three months before they started filming and learned Spanish. Now a lot of people give him credit. You know, they criticize him because of his accent. I didn't know the difference. The only people who criticize him are Colombians. So sorry. Yeah, you know. Just a sh- shocker, spoiler alert, folks. Pablo's dead. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Same ending. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Follow us on that social media thing at Game of Crimes on Twitter, Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, Game of Crimes fans, go to Facebook. Just type in that. Our favorite mafia queen will give you admittance into the inner sanctum if you just answer a couple questions. Also, join us, Patreon, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We go in depth on this stuff. We go in depth on the Narcos season three. I mean, we've got some of the most in depth stuff you'll ever hear on this. We've got a lot of fun stuff that's coming out. So join us, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. And you know what, Murph? What's that? It's been an honor. It's been great. It's been fun to have the the man who, you know, played you, you know, mm-hmm. on here. And I think he did a better job of playing you than you playing you, just <laughs> just to be honest, just to throw it out there. He's probably a little bit smarter. I'll take give him that. <laughs> I think he's a little bit sexier too. Not that I got a hey, 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 I just hey. don't go overboard here. I love right, you, boy, but uh, we got limits, you know. Yeah, we got we got the broco. We got to worry about here. So it is Kentucky, though. The family tree is a stick. So remember that. Be careful. Be, be careful there. Be careful. All right, and we'll be careful, and you guys be careful out there. And thank you once again for playing the biggest, baddest, most dangerous, and narco-friendly game of all. Narco the series, not the drug traffickers. Game of crime. <laughs>